guests and Carol and I stay with us. Um, but her brother and sister in law, it's been a great blessing to have them with us. These good people. <laughs> so, when you come to church on Sunday mornings, what are you looking for? Why do people come to church on Sunday morning? I can tell you that for myself. Well, first of all, I come for many reasons, okay? But I come, I'm going to tell you about myself and how and why I come. The plain truth is that God drew me. He whispered in my ear and I said, come. And he showed me his house was a place where you can learn about having a deep, abiding relationship with him. And can learn to be a son or daughter of the Most High God, Creator of the universe. Amen. And think about that. You know, that's an incredible thing that we get to walk with Him like that. Amen. And this is a place that we can come. And there, and there's thousands like this, okay, like our, our church. It's a place we can come and we can connect with the Lord. We can touch the hand of His robe. And, and really connect with them. And take a moment, an hour of our time, through the week, just to be in His presence. And the scripture says, in His presence there is fullness of joy. You want joy in your life? I do. This is a good place to be in His house because we can be in His presence. And we can experience that joy. I don't know about you. But I'm broken in many ways in my life. My heart's broken many times. Hey, I'm 62. It's going to happen. You know? So if you're only uh, 12 years old, then this is going to happen to you. So you can get ready now and be prepared because the Lord heals the broken heart and He binds up their wounds. That's out of Psalms. And there's a, another translation of that word wounds is He binds up their sorrows. I love it when the Lord binds up my sorrows. And that happens in his house. That happens in being around his people. And when you do that, when you come here together, and you join together in his presence, then he fills us up, and we can learn not to grow weary or faint hearted. Right? I can tell you, I don't like being weary or faint hearted, okay? So I'm, I'm glad we're not going to do that. So here's, here's where that begins. Here's where learning to not be weary or faint heart is starts. I'm going to read from Hebrews 12, or, uh, verse 2, verse 3. It says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. Now, what kind of joy can the creator of the universe have? He's got everything. It's like trying to buy something for Sandy for her birthday, you know? <laughs> She's got anything else she really has what she needs, you know? <coughs> so what kind of joy did Jesus have that for the joy set before him? It was us. It was you. We were his joy, the great joy that was set before him. And so he endured the cross, despising the shame, is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And then the First it says looking to Jesus, okay? Second it says consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. So if you, if you don't want to grow weary and faint hearted because we're all under a lot of pressure, then you do that by looking to Jesus and considering him. Now I'm going to get real practical about what that means. So first we know that Jesus was God, right? Scripture says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word's Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And so without Him, not anything was made. That was made. So that's God on the cross, right? That's God. So knowing that Jesus is God, when we are considering Jesus, 
when we were looking for Jesus, the author and the finisher, completer of our faith. He's the author, so he wrote the book. You know, I know he's going to make us conform to his image. Okay, so knowing that, that's Jesus is up there. Then what we've got to consider, because we know who he is, he's God. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Yeah. Well, but by him. We know it's all powerful, we know it's all seeing, he's good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is gracious, he's merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. So now we know who he is. And now we have to consider, you don't want to grow weary and faint hearted. I consider what he did. And y'all may have heard me say this a thousand times, and I hope to say it a thousand times more, because I have to remind myself of this every day, every hour sometimes. And that's out of Isaiah. But this is what he did on the cross. Isaiah told us literally 500 years before Jesus was born what he was going to do. That surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Now you think about it, Jesus was on the cross. There were a lot of people that were there. His mom, his mother, relatives, and friends, uh, Roman soldiers. Also, the Romans were so cruel that they did their executions high on the hill publicly by the main thoroughfare so everybody could see them. So they would go, oh, I want to be in there. So they're passerbys. So you think of all the people over there. People passing by, they probably thought, oh boy, he must be really bad to be that guy. He must have done something bad. The Romans were really mad at him worse than they thought. God was really mad at him. And that's why he's up there. He must have done something to be, you know, to be crucified in such a terrible way. And then there were soldiers who were gambling, okay? So they knew he was up there. And they probably looked up there once or twice to make sure he was still up there and the Bible was trying to steal him off there, off the cross. So they were just gambling. They were kind of having a good time. And then there were relatives that were sincerely sad, and friends were sincerely sad and grieved over this. And you think about that, today the same thing happens. Today, people may pass by the cross. They may pass by on Easter, you hear about Jesus on the cross. Jesus, Jesus in the tomb. Um, and they go, oh, well, that's true. So they, commit, they consider him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. That's, that's what they think. You know, he must have done something bad. Because they don't really check it out. All right. We can't have just a uh, surface level relationship with God because he demands all of us. He wants to draw us in and, and he wants all of our heart. He wants to be everything we need in our life. He wants that deep relationship. So, the scripture's clear. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's clear. Jesus said, seek me and you will find me. If you do these things, you can seek me and look for him. So, those people passing by, if they'd really been interested, they could have gone and checked out and find out why he was up there. But they did it. The Roman soldiers are gambling. You see that today with people. People are just out there, uh, and they know Jesus was on the cross at some time, but they just kind of play games and do other things. They know he's up there, or they know that he was, but they, uh, they don't have that relationship with him. And there's people uh, like me who were grieved over that because couldn't see that he was going to rise from the dead in three days. Couldn't see the resurrection. But then there was one Roman soldier. One Roman soldier. It wasn't even a Jew. And he said, surely, truly, this must be a son of God. He recognized Jesus for who he was. And he began to. And that's the 
that's an incredible thing that they could, that he began to see that. And so according to Isaiah, he wore our griefs, care our sorrows, and it also says that he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. A lot of big words in there, a lot of words we don't use. The transgressions, the iniquities, that is sin. That's offenses against God. We should have died on the cross. That should have been us. But it was him. He took our place. That was him. He took our, our punishment that for our sins that we should have had. And that punishment brought that that punishment that he took, it brought us peace. It made a relationship there. So he took our sins, took our iniquities, took our transgressions, and he bore our sorrows and carried our griefs. And in our life we have tons of sins. I was thinking about it. We sin just once every day. I believe I sin more than that every hour. We sin just once every day. That's 365 days a year, 365 sins in a year. And if you're, uh, you know, my age, 62, and somebody do the math, that's, oh, that's uh, mm, well, several thousand sins. And I got way more than that. I got way more. And yet, you know, he, he took punishment for those things. And on top of all that, he bore our sorrows and carried our griefs. And you cannot get by a day on this planet without having some kind of sorrow or some kind of grief. Certainly you can't get by a year without it. And the more we get, the more we accumulate. Things that we are sorrowful over ourselves and things that maybe other people have did to us didn't mean to do it, but maybe they did. But those sorrows were things that, that we want, that, that we had hoped would happen, it don't happen. Like children that we pray for for years and years. And, and we see them go in the direction that we know is going to hurt them. No, that's grievous, it is. Caroline don't have kids, and yet, we feel like we have tons of kids because the the kids have grown up and we've been so blessed to be part of their lives. And we see them like not going in a good direction and we know it's going to hurt them because we don't want them to be hurt. You know, that's grievous. But the scripture says he bore those griefs and sorrows too. I can taste those sorrows. Right? Because that's a natural thing to do. But I don't have to live in that place. You may go through darkness, but you don't have to live in the valley of the shadow of death. You don't have to live there in that sorrow, in that grief, because he already bore those things. And because he loves those kids, and he loves those things that made us, those people that made us grieve and kind of lives. Guess what? Who loves them, loves them more? Us or God? It's the Lord. He loves them. He cares for them more. And He is sovereign. And he is the one to make sure that His will is done. And that those He has called and chosen from the foundations of the earth, that they are going to be there with Him on that day. I want you to see how this plays out in my life. Whenever I, I have griefs or sorrows, I go back to these scriptures and I remind myself that those are God's. All my anxieties, my worries, all my cares, they belong to Him. He paid a great price to have the ability to have the uh, opportunity to, uh, to have the, uh, I'm not sure the word we but to be able to carry those, to be able to take the, the punishment for those things and to be able to bury those so we don't have to bury them. We don't have to win in those places. So, I have to do the constant. And by the way, those words, griefs and sorrows, in the Hebrew, can even mean uh, wounds or pain. Okay? Most of you know what I go through, so I'm not going to go into detail, but he, he carries my pains. He bore my pains. Thank you.
it shows minus stripes the pains that he went through, and we are healed. Okay, so that we're healed. It's not just a physical healing, but it means a healing in the soul. It means a, a salvation. Salvation from sin, salvation from hell. Salvation from the things that we go through that, that, that tie us down. You know, and so he brings those things, uh, brings healing to us. I pray that the Lord heals me in the next minute, okay? But if he is pleased to strengthen the just to be able to walk through this thing, then trust God. That's what I'm going to do. And he will heal me physically on that day that I've seen him. And he, he gives us a new body. The scripture's clear about that. So he heals the broken party and binds up our sorrows, binds up our wounds. But the key for us as we tiptoe and march and sludge and crawl through the dirt and grime of every day and, and the drudgery, the key is for us to look at him and consider him. Constantly, we've got to keep our eyes on him. Fix our eyes. That's another translation. Fix our eyes on Jesus. So we all can finish our faith. If you want healing from a broken heart, this is how it happens. You fix your eyes on him. It's in the scripture in Proverbs. That's the Old Testament. And it says basically the same thing. Keep your eyes straight ahead. Don't look to the left or to the right. Keep your eyes straight ahead. He directs your paths. No, I can't turn my head. Okay. So a lot of times when we just walk a semi-straight line, I have to look directly ahead. Okay, and um, we were on, on a boat on a Friday, and I got to drive it, which was really cool. And everybody uh, was alive, and they all came back the same number we left with it. So it was a good thing. So, but when I was, when I was driving, if I'm going to keep the boat in a straight line, I had to find a, a spot in the distance to focus on. And my vision's not too good, so I had to help my friends and my beautiful, lovely wife that, that helped me to see that, that spot. So I could keep straight in there. Guess what? Sometimes we cannot see straight ourselves. We can't. Our head goes, oh, look at that pretty bird over there. You know, and you go into a, a bunch of rocks or something. Or like, I can't see which way to go. But when you go to God's house, there are people there they very likely have been that way before, and they can help you. They can help you to keep that focus on Jesus, looking at Him, considering what He did. So I encourage you today, as we worship, as Keith brings the Word of God and preaches, that you do that. You consider Him, not Keith. Lord Jesus, we focus on him and hear what he has to say. And may he bless you every day this week. Amen.